Well, I am Austin Ackelmeyer, and I will be presenting about serial femtosecond crystallography of soluble proteins in lipidic cubic phase. Uh, it's a very recent paper. It was just published in September of this year. So uh, we kind of have uh, three separate parts with this. We have uh, serial femtosecond crystallography, or SFX. We have soluble proteins, and we also have lipidic cubic phase. Um, and we've actually already had a presentation on uh, lipidic cubic phase, or LCP, in this Journal Club seminar before. And uh, there you go. Uh, that was presented by uh, Joey Almos, and it is excellent. I recommend that you go check it out. Uh, it's on bioxfl.org, and it's also on YouTube with the following links that you can click on uh, after this has been posted online. So. Uh, I recommend checking that out. Uh, when I talk about LCP, I'll just kind of gloss over it since we've already had that wonderful demonstration. So SFX, as you heard about in the previous presentation, um, is a method of X-ray crystallography to determine uh, crystal structures of proteins. So what's special about this is that we have diffraction before destruction. Um, as you can see here, uh, represented by this red line. We have our X-ray pulses uh, that are very fast, very intense, and they intersect this uh, liquid jet. The current method of liquid jet is a continuous stream of protein crystals uh, in an aqueous phase, and uh, that's represented up here. Um, and once the X-ray pulses intersect or hit uh, one of these protein crystals, we it diffracts before it's destroyed, and we get an uh, X-ray diffraction pattern. Um, these the crystals that are shot through the liquid jet are much smaller than is usable by traditional synchrotron methods. Um, if we put this really small crystal inside a traditional synchrotron, it would just be destroyed immediately, um, and we wouldn't be able to. Uh, get many, if any, diffraction patterns from it. Uh, so this method has been done with soluble and membrane proteins so far. Um, and uh, moving on a little bit, we have our gas dynamic virtual nozzle. This is what actually injects the liquid into the uh, path of laser. So uh, as you can see here, uh, we have our liquid stream flowing. It's uh, letter A, or the blue stream. And it is focused by a coaxial gas that's green here, shown by B. And this forces this uh, liquid stream to become a liquid jet um, that extends into the uh, vacuum chamber. A benefit is that, like I said, it works for sm small crystals, not suitable for synchrotrons. Uh, and this is useful for time-resolved studies. Um, you can uh, irradiate your sample with a laser upstream and see how that uh, light effects or other uh, substance uh, affects your uh, protein over time um, and on a very, very short time scale. It does have some drawbacks, though. Uh, you need a large amount of crystal sample, between 10 and 100 milligrams of protein crystal. And these protein crystals are very hard to crystallize. It can take hours to make uh, micrograms of this protein. So obviously, we want to have a method that uh, needs less protein crystals. And one of the reasons that it needs so much protein crystal is because uh, quite a bit of sample is wasted in between these X-ray pulses. The laser pulses at 120 hertz, and so even if the laser is not firing, we still have this continuous stream of liquid jet uh, that contains your protein crystals. Um, that is still flowing through, and anything that is not hit by the laser is essentially wasted, and it cannot be recollected. So we want a method uh, that requires less sample and has less waste in between X-ray pulses. Uh, and this has been accomplished uh, by lipidic cubic phase, or LCP. Um, a representation that people like to point out is that it's kind of like toothpaste. Uh, it's very viscous and sticky. Um, and it's actually really good for um, membrane proteins. Uh, that's been its main purpose in the uh, past. Um, since it has this sort of lipid bilayer environment, this is where membrane proteins are most happy. It's uh, very close to their native environment, and so they can 
retain their native confirmations better. Uh, but uh, I will talk a little bit in a minute about how this study has gone away from membrane proteins and into soluble proteins. But uh, we have a phase diagram here of what can happen with these uh, lipid mesophases, um, what we would ideally shoot for, I think, is this PN3M uh, over here, that phase of lipidic cubic phase. And uh, there's another phase that it can degrade into uh, that is less desirable. So when this LCP is extended into the vacuum chamber, uh, we have a drastic pressure drop, and it goes undergoes evaporative cooling um, if you're using uh, monoolein. And uh, so this evaporative cooling effect can change the phase into this LC phase or the lamellar, lamellar liquid crystalline phase. Um, and this partially solidifies in the vacuum chamber. And essentially you get this uh, very intense diffraction that can damage your detector, which is something we really don't want to happen. Um, it also creates a lot of background. So we would like to avoid this LC phase. A way that they've done that is um, changing the uh, lipids that are used. Uh, like I was saying, monoolein or 9.9 uh, .9 mag monoacylglycerol um, undergoes this phase transition when you uh, extend the LCP into the vacuum. But other monoacylglycerols, uh, such as 9.7 mag, uh, 7.9 mag, and 9.9 mixed with 7.9 mag and a one-to-one -one ratio uh, do not undergo this transition um, into the LC phase. They stay in the LCP phase. Uh, and an important note is that transitioning into the LC phase doesn't happen uh, when it's at ambient pressures. So how do you form LCP? Uh, here is a uh, schematic of how it can form, um, how you can form it. You have two syringes that are brought into contact with each other with a coupler. One syringe contains your lipids, uh, that's your mags, uh, and another one contains your protein. Um, if you're using membrane proteins, this will just be a protein, uh, protein that is not crystallized. Um, but if you are using the method that they were using in the 2015 paper with soluble proteins, um, the protein has already been crystallized uh, in its uh, liquid, in liquid, um, and so this already contains crystals. So you do something really high tech now, you move the plungers back and forth, and this mixes the lipid and the protein, and eventually forms your LCP uh, that you can see right here. And you can disconnect uh, the couplers and then uh, what they show here is uh, transferring the LCP to a repeatable injector syringe and then putting it onto a well plate that will be used for crystallization. However, we can skip steps D, E, and F since we are already, since the protein has already been crystallized. And this can be uh, stuck right into your injector which um, I will talk about in a second. But if you want to see this process, it's um, in a video online, actually, on Jove, and I definitely recommend it. Uh, it's very interesting and very useful if you want to do this in your lab. So here's the LCP injector that I was just about to talk about. Um, once you have gone through the syringe process, your sample will be put right here, represented in red in the LCP reservoir. Um, upstream, we have our water line um, that will push a plunger, and this plunger will uh, apply pressure to these Teflon balls that will sort of deform and create a seal between the LCP reservoir and the rest of the system. Uh, an important bit to note is that to drive the LCP through uh, this nozzle, you would need very, very high pressures, but this plunger system sort of circumvents that. Uh, since you go from a wide area to a narrow area, the pressure that you apply upstream is not as much as what is applied here. So that's good. We can get away with using a little bit less pressure. It's a little bit less uh, difficult to work with. Uh, this green line up here 
represents our gas line. And this is uh, kind of keeps the LCP flowing in sort of like a straight line um, and prevents it from clogging. So this is all connected to a nozzle rod and is easily interchangeable. So here's the challenge that uh, was presented in the paper I'm reviewing right now. Um, LCP has been proven useful for membrane proteins. That's what it's really good for. It has that uh, lipid bilayer environment. But we have other macromolecules uh, that are listed up here, like large protein complexes and protein RNA complexes. And they would also like to benefit from the reduced sample consumption. So uh, can this LCP serve as a medium for soluble protein crystals? Spoiler alert, it can. So uh, the methods that they were using here are listed above. Uh, they ended up with microcrystals that were an average dimension for lysozyme of 5 by 2 by 2 microns, and for phycocyanin, or PC, it's uh, 10 by 10 by 5 microns. Um, uh, the lysozyme and the phyco were both sort of mixed in a very similar method. Both had 40 microliters of the microcrystal precipitant solution, um, and it was about 25 milligrams per milliliter, and they mixed it with uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of 9.9 .9 mag and 7.9 mag by weight. Um, in this dual syringe, dual syringe mixer that I mentioned before, and it formed a homogeneous uh, LCP. Uh, they used this 9.9 .9 to 7.9 mag instead of uh, the other uh, monooleans because FICO was not uh, suitable, or 9.7 mag was not suitable for FICO, um, and so. Uh, neither was 9.9 .9 mag since it undergoes that transition to the LC phase. So the 9.9 .9 to 7.9 was their best bet. Uh, the, uh, something to note is that we have our LCP flow rate of 170 nanoliters per minute, which is significantly slower than the about 10 microliters per minute that is present with the GDPN. So uh, uh, it flows, it is kind of like toothpaste. It flows a lot slower than just uh, an aqueous uh, liquid. So we had two samples, uh, or they had two samples, lysozyme and FICO. Lysozyme is pretty small, FICO is uh, relatively big, and they were both acquired in under an hour, which is good. Um, the hit rates were about 40% and 6.5%, um, and kind of like my gut reaction is uh, hit rates should be close to 100%, but that isn't really the case with this, because if you go much higher than 40%, uh, the probability that you're hitting multiple crystals at once with, uh, is uh, higher, and this is bad for data analysis purposes. So we want to keep it between like 30 and 40%. Um, and at the bottom are some protein database uh, numbers if you want to check these out. So here are the results for lysozyme. We can see the crystals in the top left, uh, and then we have our diffraction pattern kind of in the center here. The bright peaks are these little grayish dots, and we have a zoom in version of these several panels uh, where the bright peaks are outlined in this sort of uh, black circle. And here is a very big uh, table of data. What we're focusing on is the LCP injector uh, outlined in blue here, and it's compared to the GDBN injector. So our crystal size was uh, a bit bigger, uh, 2 by 2 by 5 instead of 1 by 1 by 1, or 2, sorry. Um, but we were able to get away with using significantly less protein, 0 0.1 milligrams versus 15 milligram. Um, so you're saving, uh, you're wasting less sample. Um, and the resolution down here was pretty similar, about 1.9 to about 1.9 angstroms. Uh, for both of them. So this is, uh, seems like a pretty reliable method. Over here we have an electron density map of the lysozyme that was uh, characterized. So this, uh, oh, the main structures, there is no difference between the previous results and the results obtained with LCP. So uh, this is good. 
Uh, as you can see on the right, we have an electron different a difference electron density map um, where green represents positive difference and red represents uh, negative difference. And uh, so you can see that there is some difference. And these are mainly on the bulky amino acid side chains. Um, and this is kind of expected. Like we have different size crystals. We have different crystallization conditions, different injection methods. So uh, the authors of this paper said that this is expected. And uh, overall, the structure that, we, that was characterized is uh, in good agreement with uh, previous literature. So moving on, we have uh, phycocyanin that they characterize. Uh, here are the crystals. Um, and again, we can see our diffraction pattern with a zoom in uh, where the black circles outline the Bragg peaks. And once more, a very big data table. Here's what we're interested in. The LCP injector, it was compared, again, to a GDP injector, but also to traditional uh, macrocrystallography methods at a synchrotron. Um, and you can see right away, this requires quite a bit larger crystal than what is present inside the uh, X-ray free electron laser. Uh, the amount of protein crystal used was quite a bit smaller. Uh, 30 milligram is what happened with GDBN, and again, 0 0.1 milligram for the LCP injector. Uh, the number of indexed images is actually very small. Under 7,000 for the LCP injector, and in comparison to the GDBN of about 17,000. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the, a pretty high resolution um, structure was determined, about 1.75 angstroms for the LCP compared to about 1.95 for the GDBN and 1.35 for the macrocrystal. So it's similar to uh, macrocrystallography um, and slightly better than the GDVN injector. Um, and this is all done with uh, significantly less index images than what was present previously. So uh, they have an electron density omit map here. Um, and this uh, basically shows the chromophore uh, matching up very well with the electron density that was uh, determined. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the wireframe agrees pretty well with uh, this uh, chromophore that's depicted here. So everything is working out pretty well. Uh, it seems that using soluble proteins inside of LCP uh, doesn't have any uh, significant negative effects um, in regards to the structure that you obtain. Um, an important thing to note is that the proteins were crystallized uh, inside of the uh, liquid form. Uh, they're uh, so not inside of the LCP. This means that this method could be uh, coupled to lots of existing crystallization uh, techniques that are already present. Uh, present. So in conclusion, we have determined that LCP can serve as a suitable medium for protein crystal introduction into SFX. Uh, as you saw, significantly less crystal suspension is needed, uh, 0.1 milligram versus uh, like 30 milligrams for traditional methods. Um, you were uh, able to obtain high resolution diffraction patterns and good quality electron density maps, and the structures are in good agreement with previous results. But there is a little bit of room to move forward. Um, we can work on finding new LCP forming lipids with higher stability. So uh, the 9.9 to 7.9 mag was uh, good for this, but certain precipitant uh, components and certain uh, high concentrations of certain components can destabilize the LCP. So uh, potentially finding new lipids to work with um, will make it easier to couple to existing crystallization methods. Um, and, of course, applying this technique to more soluble proteins. So thank you, and I would like to open it up to questions.